Lady Alchemy has been pulled off of Indiegogo, not due to lack of a film it, but due to a lawsuit by the artist and writer. Hello everybody, this is Preston Poulter here at Pocket Jacks Comics. That is just one of two of the bigger stories here this week. The other one, Richard C. Meyer has pulled the plug on his campaign for High School Ninjas, I believe the name of it was. Uh, he's retooling that campaign to, uh, I think, like beef up the number of pages in order to help justify the price. I don't know what the new offering is going to be. I mean, I guess we'll have to wait and see on that one. But he did put out some comments that uh, crowdfunding was a suboptimal platform. Both those things were kind of noteworthy. Let's go ahead and get into the Martina Markova thing. But first, my campaign for Guinevere Issue 4 is now live on Kickstarter. Link in the description or info card. Either one. Go check it out. Only 100 of these bad boys are going to be issued, and 50 without the trade dress. These 50 were previously offered on Indiegogo, pulled them off that, now they're up on Kickstarter, and they're going to move. So, link in the description, I encourage you to go check that out. All right, let's take a look at the Martina Marcota situation. So, she went on with Michael Bancroft. Uh, wherever Martina Marcota goes, she's, just, men just fawn over her. Must be nice. Uh... The Michael Bancroft appearance wasn't particularly noteworthy, uh, you know, outside of the fawning. Uh, what is interesting is that, you know, she, see, you know, what can I say? The amazing power of beautiful women. That's that's what I wrote about in, you know, Gwyneth and the Divinity Factory. Uh, you know, she's going between groups that were part of this divorce. Like, you know, I, Roe has his backdrop of Martina. Um... You know, Ethan has promoted her in the past, but here she is going on with JDA, who's going to talk about how close he is to Ethan now. Doors are still open for her amongst people who are feuding within Comicsgate. So here she is uh, explaining why you should give her money so that she can defend the lawsuit by her artist and writer. I barely know you. Uh, we were almost on a stream together for like 30 seconds. Gosh, two months ago, I think now. Uh, Nasser brought me on with Ethan, and there were a bunch of people on. And then yeah. Ethan and I needed to have like a hug fest. And oh, uh, and so everybody bailed. And I was really upset because I've always wanted to meet you. Uh, and yeah. I was like, take it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Nasser booted us all um, because he wanted to have you and, and Ethan kind of work something out. How, how'd that work out? Did you guys talk it out? How are yeah, you guys we, doing? we spooned and we're friends now. So, you know, uh, so it's all good, which is great. Uh, These people are just disgruntled yes it is like clearly i own it and i don't understand how people try to make sense of their logic uh, of like well you know he drew you and do you have a contract blah blah and it's like guys there's so much retardation involved in all of that kind of circular logic right by the way i i did read through the lawsuit uh what what's interesting all right so the artist and writer have sued in federal court, because there's a diversity of jurisdictions, uh, they're out of Los Angeles, and she's wherever she is. I think they cited her as being in New York, but you know, she kind of moves around. I believe her husband's still in the UK. Uh, so it's a federal case. Those tend to be a little pricier, from from what I've heard, in terms of you know fees, and the attorneys who represent you in federal court tend to maybe charge slightly higher by the hour. Uh, it's not going to be a cheap case, particularly because there doesn't seem to be any clean paperwork. The artist and writer uh, did not cite a breach of contract claim, which, you know, they are just citing copyright infringement. Now, clearly there was some agreement between, you know, the three parties. You know, she's out promoting the campaign. She's showcasing their artwork. Uh, she's asking the writer, apparently, like, you know, what's the story about? All this good jazz. So clearly there was some agreement between the three. And even if there's not a formal contract with signatures, that doesn't mean that what they agreed to can't be legally binding although it has to be really clear uh, in terms of what was being agreed to. And maybe if there's, you know, text messages that say one thing and emails that say another, and then there's a phone call where something else was agreed to, it could be that maybe there really is no valid contract here. So uh, the writer and artist uh, in their lawsuit are not citing a contract. That would certainly make it easy. In the absence of a contract, well, I mean, you know, Clearly, Martina is going to say that Lady Alchemy is her trademark, and of course she, you know, has the rights to her own likeness, and you know that's all very true. But if there was a collaboration where you know she's providing the one piece of it, and then the you know writer is like, oh hey, I've had this story for a while, and she's out promoting that, and you know the artist has provided the artwork, and the money was raised. 
under that, uh, you know, under ba basically those three created an IP together effectively. And that was what the money was raised under. And then the question is, well, who has claimed to the money? And they're claiming, well, we have claimed to the money because that's my story. And, you know, for the artist, that's my art. And she's saying, no, no, no. We And now she has to say we had an agreement that I was going to pay and this and that and the other. So for her to come in and say, hey, a contract did exist. These people, This was a work for hire thing. That's going to be very messy. That's going to be a lot of discovery. They're going to have to be depositions where questions are going to be asked. Well, in this email and in this text message, when you said this and she said that, what did you think that meant? Did you think you were agreeing to this? You know, it's it's uh, there's no way that this case is going to see uh, even a motion for summary judgment uh, for, you know, 80 to 100 thousand dollars. And I don't know if that case can be decided on a motion for summary judgment. I might have to go to trial. So the initial announcement of Martina of her breaking off with her art team was back at March. Info card to check that out. And since then, she has raised some additional funds because Comicsgate is a bunch of sims for a pretty lady. You know, what can we say? Uh, so her campaign total was, I think the lawsuit cited like huh, high 48,000 or so when it when the lawsuit was filed in, you know, I want to say October of last year. And since then, I think maybe it's it's even gone a little bit over 50. But there's no way, one, that if you're the writer and artist, you believe that she really has that money sitting in her checking account that you can seize. Uh, you know, they speculated back in their interview. And again, you can go back and listen to this uh, when I went over it back in March. But they said at the time, like, she's already gone through the money. So if they think she's gone through the money, what are they really suing over? Uh, I mean, is it just like the principle of the thing? Uh the legal fees that are going to be associated with this case are going to be far and away above the amount of damages that can be recovered. Uh, although Martina is hoping that the comics gate simps will once again provide for and pay her legal fees. So let's hear her explain that. I am Lady Alchemy. I own the campaign. They're trying to say that they own the Indiegogo campaign and that I was brought on board by them as a promoter. Huh. Like, what? That's insane. If you have an Indiegogo campaign... Once you go live, you have to put your tax identification in there. You're a verified user on Indigo. Uh, you know, like I've been getting the tax forms. I've been paying the bills. I've been doing everything. I am lady. Why would I give someone else permission to use Lady Alchemy, my trademark, and run a campaign? Yeah. 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 What do you mean I came on as a promoter for my, my own trademark? Like, that's insane. I own it. It's me. First of all, right. uh, it is uh, my likeness and my image, and there are publicity, you know, uh, r rights or rules and stuff. You can't just like take my image and my likeness and just own it and tell me I can't draw my own self ever, right. you know, with my new artist, because that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to claim that my new artist is infringing on his rights, which is just insane because I paid him as a freelance artist. And yeah, my invoice is a contract. And also, there are three things that are required to prove. Um, now, what she said there is kind of interesting. You know, she said, my invoice is a contract because shouldn't the artist or writer, right, if what she's saying is true here, and that's it's my, it's my campaign. I know it seems like it's her campaign, but it's my campaign. I raised this money on Indiegogo. My estimation, having read the lawsuit, is just the writer and artist are like, you raise those funds using our stuff. We want our, our chunk. Uh, and maybe they were already previously paid. I don't, I don't know the details between these people. But she's saying, my invoice is a contract. But should they be billing her? Um, right? In which case, their invoice was, was the contract. And that, that was kind of a weird thing for her to say. Uh, what is it called? Implied license. And I fulfill all three of those. You know, I asked him to produce you know, artwork and he was producing artwork and gave them to me in, you know, various, various emails and formats and ways and uh, stuff like that. And uh, it, there was an intent to distribute, which I have all the proof of. As well. So yeah, the way she's talking is that, you know, she was the one organizing it and in which case, you know, they would have been providing her with invoices. Uh, I will let you know right now, uh, due to the power of Comicsgate, she has over $4,000. Uh, that is a drop in the bucket of what she's going to need for a federal case in California. But if you would like, Lady Alchemy desperately needs your help uh, over on GoFundMe. All right, so your boy Zach, 
uh, went on and he was just talking about, you know, how fortunate he was to have, you know, been there and captured lightning in a bottle back in 2018. But those days are gone and they're not coming back. And now it's just coming down to certain people who can go out and make a name for themselves. And, and he's happy that he's one of them. Uh, this was, you know, he goes on to talk about how he was disappointed in the launch of, uh, I don't know, High School Ninja, Rock and Roll Ninja, whatever his, his project is. But he does a fair amount of homework here. So, you know, I'm going to say, good job, Richard C. Meyer, for doing a thorough analysis. Uh, I, I, I love spreadsheets, so let, let's listen to what he has to say here. This uh, Rock and Roll Ninja issues one and two. I'm very, 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 very excited about it, but it's doing okay. So <laughs> do some more research. I do this periodically. I have a couple of spreadsheets, my own sales figures. And for 2020, I had a fantastic year, insanely good year. And yet still, I feel like we've hit the peak and now we're on the downslope. And I told some people that I go, yeah, I think, I think crowdfunding is winding down. We're selling expensive comics that arrive months later. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not sustainable indefinitely. So then I start. I mean, I got to say in terms of crowdfunding, um, there's no reason why they have to be expensive comics that arrive months later. Like with my campaign for Guinevere issue four, now granted, it's gonna. It's got a pretty high price point. I'm offering them at twenty five dollars each, but it's one of only a hundred. They're gonna be delivered really soon, right? And then within, I'm planning to launch the main campaign within like a month to six weeks, and that one's gonna have a gorgeous book delivered right here in the United States for ten dollars, including shipping. I don't think that's overly ridiculous. So. You know, I feel like there's no reason necessarily to think that crowdfunding has to involve an expensive comic, which has to be delivered only months and months and months down the road. I made, you know, that decision early on that I, I didn't want that, and I'm glad to see Richard C. Meyer pointing that as something that maybe uh, is not a good business practice. If only someone would have had the courage to tell other people in Comicsgate that, oh well. I started doing a whole bunch of research, uh, Brian Polito campaigns. And you can see he has an upward trajectory. Although still, after doing this for years, he's never broken 3,000. The highest he got was uh, 2968 on the latest uh, Lady Death. Scott Snyder, like the number one writer in comics for 10 years. 4,000 backers. To me, that's really small. Sean Gordon Murphy, uh, for a couple years, he was the hottest thing going. This was kind of a year after he was the hottest thing. He might have been like number three. 3,200 backers. I'm not trying to flex, but Jawbreaker's Grand Bazaar did 4,326. And this was actually the lowest selling Jawbreaker's uh, Grand Bazaar, but it might be at more of a sustainable level. So then I look at stuff like Berserker, Keanu Reeves. Billions of people have heard of him and like him. And, you know, he had an extremely successful crowdfunder, but it's 14,000. That is 0.000001% of people who like Keanu Reeves. This old day of, you know, Jawbreakers doing 10,000 backers, that's gone. <laughs> when this happened, there are multiple factors, one of which is I basically had almost no competition at all. Now, he said that before. I, I don't I don't agree. Uh, there was always other projects that were going on, including mine, uh, that you know people could have gone and put money into. He, he just you know had the spotlight due to the social media phenomenon that was Comics in 2018. So I did this for Malin. So he has an upward trajectory. Sweetcast does as well. Then there's uh, Tim Lim. If you look at this, it's doing really good. I mean, it goes from 38,000 to 108,000 on the second one. He hasn't even done the Indiegogo. So once he does the Indiegogo, and you look at these comparisons, the Kickstarter uh, does better. Funding is getting crowded and it is attenuating unless you do things like Tim Lim and Sweetcast. I'm in a you know a position. There's there's some things that are non-repeatable. Uh, you know, I was able to come in before most people got here. A whole bunch of crazy stuff happened. I'm basically looking at, you know, when I talk about SJWs who come into comics and they're just using it as a bus stop to Hollywood, and I say, I was here before you got here, I will be here long after you're gone. So I'm just going to ride this crowdfunding until the wheels fall off. I went on a deep dive 
uh, the night this launched because I'm like, what the hell? This should make 50000 the first night. Two years ago, it would have. And then I was starting to look at things. Does anyone remember when uh, B. Clay Moore made 20000 on a book? It was like eight or nine years ago. Uh, Richard C. Meyer is about to go on to make kind of a reversion to the meme argument that essentially, you know, like B. Clay Moore, you yeah, remember back when he made, you know, $10,000, but that, you know, the whole social media phenomenon around comics, it came in and then, oh, wow, look at all this money, but that that's not sustainable. You know, the air is leaving the balloon and now we kind of have to be happy with lower numbers, basically. It blew everyone's minds. We couldn't believe it. $20,000. Um, and then this guy, Mark Andrew Smith, made 100000 with um, James Stokoe art. So it was James Stokoe, basically. On uh, Sullivan Sluggers. And I couldn't believe that. That might as well have been $100 million. People got a little, you know, oh, it's 100000 That's no big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. In fact, if you do 30000 that's, it's gone back where 30000 is like impressive. 30000 to 50000 it's like, oh shit. Yeah, that was a good, solid hit. SJWs just keep on breaking things. One of the reasons that crowdfunding is, is I feel it's going to attenuate is because interest in mainstream comics. Crowdfunding was always a satellite. You know, the mainstream comic book industry, that was the sun. Crowdfunding was a planet, and it was one of the smaller planets. What happens when a sun dies? I was describing... Now, this is kind of interesting because these these comparisons between... You know, like, Rags Comics is, I think, the great example because they seem to do well, I think, in comic book stores. But how well do you... You know, when you look at Rags and you compare it to... Some of the people in Comicsgate were putting up the crowdfunding numbers. How do you compare those two? How do you go, well, well, Rags sold well in comic book stores, but, you know, Sweetcast did okay on Downcast. Uh, who, who, how can we determine the power of Comicsgate? Uh, yeah, so now it turns out Richard C. Meyer is saying, well, the place we needed to be was local comic book stores. I don't know why they didn't try harder to get in there. Speaking of, go pick up White Lily. It is coming out. It uh, should be next week. Yes, on Wednesday at your local comic book store. One of only two gorgeous covers. Here they are right here. By the way, if you can get your hands on this cover, I only got sent like a few of them. This is a hard to get cover. Find this one. Uh, and here's just the, you know, the main retail cover. But those and your local comic book store. So again, if this is true, and I mean, look, Richard has done a pretty thorough job of looking at the data here. He's been around. He's certainly put out a, a, you know, a number of campaigns. Uh, maybe somebody needed to say this way back when? Crowdfunding, and I described it as suboptimal. You had, uh, you know, the newsstand. That was super optimal. And that there were comics literally everywhere. Everywhere. They were generally of a dependable quality, although it varied. And then we got uh, the direct market. The direct market was not super optimal. It was merely optimal. But optimal is good. Optimal survived multiple recessions. But crowdfunding is suboptimal. It cannot exist on its own. And it's going to attenuate because there, because people remember things that were more optimal. So he's saying that essentially you should be in the direct market, that that is the optimal place to be. To me, I would include crowdfunding in the direct market. I mean, there's no middleman between the creator and the fan. Uh, now, granted, I'll, there is this perception that there's going to be a long time between fulfillment, but as you see with my campaigns, that, that, that doesn't need to be true. The campaign for the White Lily Trade paperback which has now been completed. Isn't that a gorgeous book printed right here at AP? I got this thing. I love it. Ah, uh, you know, all right. So that one for me took a while because I couldn't get it from my local printer. I had to go to e API out of Tennessee and, you know, it's a bigger company. They're not able to cycle it as quickly. But that campaign was done within a couple of months. And that for me is a long time. So there, there's no reason why crowdfunding shouldn't be considered part of the direct market. And, you know, it's, I'm already moving in that direction. I've got my eBay store, and what is more direct than eBay? Link in the description. Go there. Uh, you know, I put up 99 cent auctions. I don't have one this week, but make, make me your favorite seller. Uh, those auctions have been doing really well for me. Somebody took their CBCS graded metal cover and they posted it to a Facebook forum, and I've gotten like 
15 to 20 orders based off of that post for, you know, the White Widow 4 cover. It, God, it's a gorgeous whiskey paint cover. Uh, who, by the way, was the artist for Gwen issue 4? Link in the description. It's going right now. Go, go, get in. So, I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly what uh, Richard C. Meyer really means when he's saying the direct market is optimal, but crowdfunding is suboptimal, but I do understand when he's saying that the glory days are behind us and lean times are ahead. So there's a drama situation unfolding right now as I'm recording. Uh, Dark Gift is over streaming with Pan. It, like at some point it's got to go, okay, I'm going to cover that next week. But uh, here was Dark Gift on with Dean and Testify. There was some discussion about the X. Whatever, X is X. Okay, but what is interesting is that Dark Gift is on the stream right now saying that Testify told him, uh, you know, in confidence that he absolutely needed to go ahead and make the book with, you know, my ex-wife, Aubie. But on, you know, this stream, he's, you know, casting a lot of shade at it. And Dark Gift is, you know, on his stream now going... See, what Panda said was right. He is a filthy clout chaser. He lied to me. I don't know. Um, I mean, if he is a clout chaser, he's certainly not the only one. Can he be dishonest? I mean, uh, in, in this clip, you should be able to hear him saying that uh, he stopped talking to me because of my future intended use for the Comicsgate trademark. Uh, that timeline doesn't work, right? We had that conversation in my Discord. Then we immediately went on, you know, his channel. Then a couple weeks later, I'm on his channel again. He's still in my Discord, dropping links and on. And then, like, he left a week or two ago. No explanation. So I, I don't buy that. I certainly think he's willing to fudge details in order to create a narrative uh, that he gets to be the center of. Uh, whether you call that cloud chasing or what have you, I don't know. But, uh... This is a developing story. We'll talk more about it next week. But here, I thought this was interesting. They are speculating as to what's going to happen once I once the trademark becomes registered in my name. Ask me what, talk, what are you doing? AG trademark what are you for doing? A I noticed Well Read uh, on a stream with Preston recently. You had some words to say to him. What do you think about Preston Poulter trademarking the term comic skate? What do you think of that? <laughs> I think it's a big troll, personally. Like I think he's doing it just so he can mess with the creators who... Um, who use I would the, say that's the more than a time. troll, though. Now, when I went on with Rare Red over on Big Daddy's channel, uh, you know, at the time, that was one of the things he seemed upset about. Now he's just like, it's a big troll. I don't know why he was so upset at the time. That's, you're that's you're, you're, hundred, you're hundred percent right, but it's more than a troll. It's actually like it's an him. act like to harm others. Well, has he ever done anything with the trademark? No, but he plans to if if people. Well, I think I think John Della Rose released Robo Toad under the Comic Skate TM. Oh, that CG drama merry-go-round. Yes, John Della Rose did release Robo Toad, where myself and Vicky were the main characters. What a crazy time that was. It won't affect anything until it's officially licensed under his name. Officially. I got Robo Toad. Testify is right here, uh, in large part because he talked to me. Where? It was a piece of shit. Yeah. It, 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 Robo Toad is a total piece of shit, and it pains me to say that because my name's in the book and my trademark's on the back of the book. I hoped it had, would have been better, John. Anything that's been Comicsgate before he's officially in charge of it won't matter. Yeah, but if people try to promote their book as a Comicsgate book, yeah, uh, he'll fuck with you. Yeah, he he plans on uh, like especially I, if you do it on YouTube. If you do it on YouTube, he's gonna stick a stick a dick up your ass he'll, he'll like, DMCA like you up he likes ass. women to stick a dick up his he does he have the money you. He, does he have the money to go around does he have the money to take a dick up his ass he, I don't think you need money he could take you don't need money he could take 10 inches <laughs> like a champ Dean <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure like Dean always has to go there I guess he considers it part of his charm oh. what <laughs> Does he have Can the money he... to go around suing people? Yes, he does. Anyway, so there you go. There, there was some speculation about what's going to happen with the comic. To a certain extent, I'm going to go, 
who even cares at this point, right? War Campaign has declared Comics Gate dead. Uh, Richard C. Meyer is going, gosh, crowdfunding's not very good. The power of Comicsgate is not... This idea that Comicsgate was going to grow and everybody grow your channel, here we are, we're now realizing, no, that wasn't true. I said this, you know, remember, hey, info card, when I was like, wow, the campaign metrics are kind of declining, all the hate... Com Go back and read all those hateful comments I got at the time and how people were like, you're, you're biased, you're all these other things. Now people are like, accepting it as fact. I... People have to spend a period in denial and attack the truth tellers, I understand. But really, who even cares about the term anymore? I don't even understand why anyone's upset. Who's really marching under the banner? Richard C. Myers? Not. Ethan? Not really. Right? Who, who, who's marching under the banner these days? Not War Campaign? Not Richard C. Meyer? Not really. Ethan? Um, you know, Ethan's kind of rebranded to all caps. I, I don't even understand who's left to become upset about this. But uh, anyway, there you go. So uh, it ended up being a fairly interesting week in Comics Gate news after all. This has been Preston Poulter with Pocket Jacks Comics. Thank you very much for your time. Take care.